Hello everybody, um, I'm doing this as a video, kind of a reply to a, a gentleman named California Catholic, I, I think his actual name is Terry, he and I got into a bit of a discussion on my buddy uh, Bill from MCO for Helps page about the whole come home, Catholics come home com campaign, um, and, and I had asked him, he had said that the Roman Catholic Church is the true church and that's, that's all that matters, I had asked him if, if he believed that there uh you know, if there's basically two sources of doctrine, the written source, that is a scripture, and then the unwritten source, which are traditions handed down from the apostles uh, to their successors, etc., etc. After a little bit of defining terms, um, and I, I probably wasn't clear in my definition of the terms originally, you know, he, he agreed that, you know, using the Second Thessalonians, I think it was 2.15 proof text, um, that there were other traditions outside of the scriptures handed down. I then asked him if he believed uh, the doctrine of Mary's sinlessness was one of those separate doctrines of scripture, a uh, separate body of doctrines, uh, not found in scripture per se, but uh, you know passed down throughout the generations. He said he thought that particular teaching was implicit in scripture and later developed under tradition. Well, I pointed out to him that he was now using the same word to. Uh, describe two separate things. He first used tradition as, you know, an oral body of doctrines handed down from the apostles to their disciples, etc., etc. And now he's using tradition uh, to say just the basic, you know, tradition, the the current beliefs of the church of a particular age. Um, so anyway, he said that it, it was uh, implicitly scriptural, the concept of Mary's sinlessness. And I asked him, you know, where, where he believed he found it. So he, he sent me a private message. He sent me uh, a link to uh, the Catholic Answers website. I think it's catholic.com. And want to interact a bit with the arguments made. Actually, no, before I do that, I, I would first like to uh, talk about the, the concept. He, he was very wise in saying that this is probably not something handed down from the apostles throughout the generations onward. Why do I say that? Well... Is the idea of Mary being sinless, uh, is it found in the early fathers? Well, let, let's let's take a gander. First, we have Justin Martyr in uh, 150. Uh, he said, talking to Trifo, uh, an Israeli Jew, he's like, Now we know that he did not go to the river, he's talking about Jesus, because he stood in need of baptism or the descent of the Spirit like a dove. Even he submitted to be born and crucified, not because he needed such things, but because of the human race from which uh, which from Adam had fallen under the power of death and the guile of the serpent, and each one of which had committed a personal transgression. Uh, Justin's pretty specific, and he seems to believe that every single human per person had sinned. Now, you know, a lot of Catholic apologists were going to say, well, it's just understood that Justin would exclude uh, the mother of Jesus from that. Well, let's see if that's the case. It's a little more concrete a little further down the line. Well, here we have Tertullian, in 200 AD. <clears throat> now he's talking about Matthew 12, uh, where Jesus' mothers and brothers uh, go to see him. He says, first of all, no one would have told him that his mother and brothers were standing outside if he were not certain of both, that, that he had a mother and brethren. Now he's talking um, about, Tertullian's talking about uh, Jesus being a real person and not just seeming to be real the way some Gnostics were saying. Just uh Incidentally, he's like, in this very passage, indeed, their, their unbelief is evident. Jesus was teaching the way of life, preaching the kingdom of God, and actively engaged in the healing of the infirmities of body and soul. But all the while, while strangers were intent on him, his very nearest relatives were absent. By and by, they turn up and they keep outside. They don't go in because, forsooth, they set a small store. They set a small store on uh, which was doing within. Nor do they even wait as if they had something they could contribute more necessary than uh, that which he could, was so earnestly doing, preferring to interrupt him and preferring to uh, call him away from his great work. Now, you know, criticizing Mary for her unbelief in Jesus and considering her behavior impertinent, this is not something who believed that Mary was sinless uh, would accuse Mary of. You know, he talks about the whole family, not just the brothers, but Mary himself. Now... If you find that a little vague, okay, here's this This could not be more explicit from uh, St. John Chrysostom. Incidentally, that quote from Tertullian is at the Flesh of Christ, chapter 7. Here's John Chrysostom. For while he talked to the people, it said, one told him, your mother and brothers are, are 
seeking you. But he said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? As declaring that she had no advantage from this unless she do all that was required to be done. For in fact, that which she had essayed to do was of superfluous vanity, and that she wanted to show the people that she had power and authority over her son, imagining not as yet anything uh, great concerning him, uh, whence her unseasonable approach. Now that was uh, in his homilies on the Gospel according to St. Matthew uh, number 44. Now, that's kind of an outer. John Chrysostom accuses Mary of being superfluously vain based on her behavior in Matthew 12. Interestingly, I don't agree with the exegesis of Tertullian and Chrysostom concerning this chapter. I don't think Mary was misbehaving here at all, but it's not really the point. The point is that there's a tradition handed down orally and preached since the time of the apostles that Jesus' mother lived sinlessly. None of these guys would believe she didn't, right? Um, so there's that. I think we could pretty much strike from the record the concept of Mary being sinless throughout her whole life, uh, being that it was you know, believed by the earliest of the apostolic fathers. They were either silent on it, or they're just, you know, they, they actually denied it. So, is this a doctrine that is implicitly biblical? Let's check it out. Um, so, on the Catholic Answers website, um, the, one of the first things that I, I really object to about this website is they, they kind of use a propaganda technique in calling any Protestant who has a you know who differs with uh, Roman Catholicism on their doctrine a fundamentalist, and you know that that's a real that that's something of a term fraught with a lot of uh, negative uh, connotations. It's almost like telling a Catholic, you know, anybody who has a problem with your doctrine, don't take them too seriously. They're just a fundamentalist. Um, I'm not wowed about that. You know, I, I wouldn't consider myself a fundamentalist. I don't have a problem with drinking, you know, some alcohol, not getting drunk, anything like that. Um, I don't read the King James 1611 version and that version only. Um, you know, I don't have a problem with going to the movies. I, I enjoy pop culture. I, I, I would not consider myself a fundamentalist. Yet, I do have a problem with a lot of Roman Catholic uh, dogma because I, I don't believe it can be traced to the apostles, nor do I believe that it's implicitly biblical. So, you know, what do they say about it here? Uh, moving on to that, is, uh, concerning Luke 128, where the angel calls Mary, Hail, highly favored. Uh, it says, the newer translations leave something out that the Greek conveys, something the older translation conveys, which is that this grace, in the core of the word, uh, ke keratomene, ke is charis, after all, is once permanent in a singular kind. The Greek indicates a perfection of grace, a perfection that must be perfect, not only intensively, but extensively. The grace Mary enjoyed must not only have been full or strong or complete as possible but at any given time, but it must have been extended over the whole of her life from conception. That is, she must have been in a state of sanctifying grace from the moment of her existence to have been called full of grace or to have been filled with divine favor in a singular way. This is just what the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception holds. Um, I see on the clock on my camera running a little long here, so I'm going to uh, delve in, you know, I'm going to break that down uh, in the second video. Stay tuned.